So that brings us to our second match of the day. It's going to be Silverdame taking on Viper in this one. We saw both of these players play yesterday. Both of them picked up wins, and both of them have uh, very different lineups. I think if you had showed me their lineups actually side by side, I would have gotten wrong who brought what, uh, because to this week, Silverdame has brought some pretty standard-looking decks, which I think are solid and good, and Viper has brought a pretty much full aggressive lineup to this one as we now get a look at the pick and ban phase um, of this one where you get to shield one of your decks from being banned away. That's what that divine shield over where the class means. And then you get to ban away one of your opposing classes where you then play a best of three conquest match from there. So what, what talk to me about these decks and what you're thinking about them. I'm personally like really happy just to see someone going with a super aggressive lineup in this format. It's uh, quite unique in terms of the lineups in the field to see someone do that. I'm um, talking, of course, about Viper, and he's so far been very interested in both of his series so far in protecting that Shaman deck. Um, Silvername, on the other hand, does have kind of a variation of his own. He has a couple of slower decks and a couple of aggressive decks. One of the more aggressive decks in his lineup is the Rogue that we were both big fans of uh, yesterday, Admirable. This is a deck that we both played a decent amount of. You to ridiculous degrees, where Wolf Riders and additional cards like that have mm. got in with Sinister Strikes. Um, but I played a deck very similar to this, um, just with the addition of Zephyrus the Great in there as well. Some of that extra late game finishing power when you've played your Myra's Unstable Earth. Yeah, Silverdame says, none of that nonsense, give me the Fairy Dragon on turn two. It's a pretty straightforward, aggressive deck. Uh, with the addition of Hooked Scimitar, this deck got a pretty uh, big, I'd say, power jump in terms of its assault power. Being able to coin Scimitar into Dread Corsair is a major turn two that you could look at when you're on coin, as well as just a, a pretty decent one drop with Pharaoh Cat, giving you a little bit of extra gas and some chip damage along the way. I feel like that uh, the aggro rogue deck has not been settled on what it'll look like in its final iterations and what the tech choices Agreed. are. But it, right now, I believe it is a force to be reckoned with, and it will remain so as it's one of the decks that is untouched by balance changes. Speaking of a force to be reckoned with, Electra Storm Surge showed that it itself was a force to be reckoned with yesterday as it came off the, off the top as the only out for Viper in a situation where he looked completely lost, doubling up a Lava Burst to win the game against RDU. Uh, Viper yesterday got off to a 2-0 start against RDU. Silvername also getting off to a much better start this season than last. He picked up a 2-1 win, um, showing signs that he might be improving on his 5-9 and nine record from last season. I think with relegations at stake, players are you gonna, got to. They're going to opt to take it more seriously, and I'm excited about that. You know, you looked at the middle of uh, season one last time, the players who were doing fairly poorly, it seemed like they were reluctant to uh, to to really do much else. They're like, I'm going to keep trying to do the same thing and see if it works. Yeah. With relegations at stake, if you're losing in the middle of the season, you got to figure it out fast or you're looking at Grandmasters for you coming to an end. Yeah, I think when that relegation starts to loom and it's staring a few of these players in the face, I think we might just see some uh, serious effort changes going in from what we saw in Season 1 because... When these grandmasters have to face the possibility of profit, <laughs> of... I'm sorry. Ah, that was perfect timing. All right, so while I finish this, if you guys aren't interested in what I'm saying right now, just rewind to yesterday. And Admirable and I had an argument about how trash that card is of Pharaoh Cat. We'd, we'd, we probably would have it again right now, but I'm just going to keep on with what my point was, yes. which is. Um, <laughs> When these Grand Masters players are faced with the prospect of having to fall back down into that Masters Tour system to fight their way back up again, I think they'll start to realize just how good they have it as Grand Masters right now, and they will fight and scrap and claw and do everything they can to hold on to that status. Step number one with this deck, take board control. Step number two, deal face damage. Also, Generous Mummy sucks, the Brotherhood but... Shell yeah, I, I think I think for Viper, he's not even close to thinking about that range right now. He's he is solely on the Edwin sucks plan. Yeah. Well, no Edwin. What? what? Hmm? Well, to play against. Look at him. <laughs> it's turn three for Viper. Sure. He doesn't have ways to fight back against this unless he wants to either overload himself and do nothing, or unless he wants to take six. I think take six ends up being the plan. Perhaps for Viper. take six again. Mm, no. How do you kill that next turn? With Thunderhead stuff? You have Thunderhead Zap. Mm -hmm. That's four. Oh, you're right. Why not? For, for some reason, my brain completely switched off, and I thought he was going into five. Well, you turn. thought the Generous Mummy was already in play. <laughs> yes. That's what I did. Yeah, I'm not taking six. I'm overloading. Jeez. That is 
disgusting. Yeah, you, you saw the see, wince from Viper. Yes, the disgusted look on Viper's face. <laughs> Honestly, now you can play Generous it's Mummy. It's kind of like, you know what? Generous Mummy seems like a thing right now. It's it, not that bad. I'm it, telling you, it, it's not that bad. Mm, look, in this matchup, Viper has to fight for board, right? That means he has to expend his cards. What does that mean? It means your opponent has less so ways to options. take advantage of Generous Mummy. In slower matchups, their cards are already clunky. Yes, they get accelerated, but they have to check the Mummy along the way. The card, when I first saw it, I said, this, this card's terrible, you'll never use this. The first time it got played against me, I went, wow, my hand's really cheap. Wow, that thing's gonna deal me 10 damage. <laughs> you remember Arcane Golem? <laughs> you remember Arcane Golem? Yes, Arcane Golem did guaranteed damage. You could draw it off the top and it was lethal. That's a completely different scenario. It's a different scenario, but what I'm telling you is there's a lot of things that aggro decks will do in order to obtain damage. There I is, think taking risks is one of them. There is a ridiculous level of things that you will do to attain damage. There's a ridiculous number of things that Silverdame will do to attain damage. Hey, whoa, whoa okay. I, in the scenario where your opponent literally has one mana on the following turn, yes, a three mana 5-4 is a good card. Get I'm, idiot. I'm not arguing that. Yeah, point. get him! <laughs> when did I say it was never good? You said just now, that card is never good, admirable, you're an idiot. <laughs> well, the subtext did have the you're an idiot, <laughs> as, as does everything that I say to anyone, but... <sighs> yeah, the true story of this one is uh, Generous Mummy brought to you by Edwin Van Cleef. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's like when you go to a concert and it's headlined by someone, by someone really analogy. good. And then like the, the next band comes up and you're like, what is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Edwin was the good band. Generous Mummy's the follow up. Yeah, they weren't bad, but they weren't good. It's like, but you know what? They got the job done. It's like a festival festival where you're at like stage two and you watch the band that you're really, really interested in watching. And then some guy you've never heard of comes out afterwards. You're like, all right, I'll, I'll hang around. <gasps> this guy's got. Oh, I forgot about the Generous Mummy Spirit of the Frog interaction where your ones, where your twos become ones and they draw more twos. Yes, as the Spice Girls famously once said, when two become one. <laughs> talking about bands that is an issue for silver name however i think that this being an aggro matchup he's off to the to the races with damage yes. and it, right now i think it's firmly in his favor yeah for sure i mean like i said you know, getting back to sort of serious analysis at this point like arcane golem was fine and playable in outright face decks because it was guaranteed damage silver name played a 5-4 in a scenario where it was guaranteed damage because viper just didn't have the mana to respond to it on the on the following turn so if you can play, if you can play Generous Mummy in a situation where it was always going to deal its five as a minimum, yeah, sign me up. Like that would be a playable card in some decks. Well, it's gotten in for ten now, yep. and it's still not touched. Yep. What do you think of Generous Mummy now? Yeah, yeah, yeah get him! I think to be generous, it's terrible. <laughs> it's all ten. That has uh, been a pyroblast from a pharaoh cat. Can we? Please separate from the results-oriented thinking. No. For a moment. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fine. Results are part of what matters. Uh, yes, but not the whole of what matters. Not the whole, but it's part of it. Yeah. And right now, it's looking like 2-0 generous mummy. <laughs> Did he win the last game? Did yeah. Okay. It got right. frozen twice, and he dominated that game. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. It didn't actually end up dealing any damage, but it, it baited right. out the four straight frosts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like to attack a generous mummy twice. Not a good feeling. Share the wealth. Oof. Wiggins well, takes zero from it. Yep. Thanks to the quicksand elemental. Still a big oof, because if he's going to have any hope of winning, he needs to find some way to race, and that rock fire weapon is his best racing tool if he draws a doom hammer off the top. All for naught, because Leroy was the last card. Yep. Yep, I think Viper, uh, you know, that's Edwin Van Cleef for you. That card is super powerful, and I'm telling you, Aggro Rogue is here to stay. Yes. And ag again, when you play an Edwin Van Cleef and your opponent has to use three cards which all overload him to answer it, 
yeah, following that up with a 5-4 with a massive downside, like, the, the relevant part of that description is a 5-4. Like, just following it up with that is good enough because you know it's just going to start pounding away and dealing damage. Yeah, and so for, for Viper in that situation, you could look at it and say, why didn't you just wait for the Thunderhead in order to take care of in that situation? He knows that he's against an aggressive rogue deck. Yeah, he yeah. knows that every point of damage is going to count. His goal is to try to burn through the Edwin and hope that there's a weak follow-up on the other side from Silvernape. Precisely. That wasn't the case got pushed out of the game. Yeah, and the fact that it was a two-turn wait with the Thunderhead to be able to deal with it anyway, like, he could have just dropped the Thunderhead the turn afterwards and hoped that it had, like, soft taunt and, and like, it was respected, but, not, like, that's not going to happen. Yeah. You're just, if, you're, if your Edwin is in the region of dealing, like, 18 damage, like, you're going to send that in multiple times um, from Silvername's side of the board. So I think he made the right call in respecting it. Like you said, it's just a kind of roll the dice play where you say, I hope my opponent doesn't have good follow-up with this. Like, maybe it's just, like, a dagger up deck hand kind of turn or something like that I can cope with and then rebuild afterwards with the Thunderhead. The fact that it was all, like almost exactly Generous Mummy was about <laughs> in that particular situation was about the best card that he could have had to play. And with that, we're going to go to a break. Generous Mummy was the perfect card there in Soddle's words only. When we come back, game number two of Silver Name versus Viper. Stay tuned. Hello, my name is Kong Shu. Uh, my handle is Strife Crow. I think my original name uh, was just like Strife. I think I just stole it from someone else that I saw online at the time when I was like 10. Uh, one of my favorite esports memory, uh, it was like a dream hack. I ended up having like this like epic, like I don't even know how long this game against Glento eventually beat me in that game, but I kind of brought the mage to the tournament, not as like See, I thought it was like the best thing ever, but because I, I just wanted to like show people I could destroy everyone with my, with my kind of like troll deck. The thing I'm most looking forward to in Grandmasters is kind of the, uh, the dynamic, because I've never really had this like league kind of dynamic in the past. You have two matchups a week, and you can kind of like target them. You know, you can start making spreadsheets, see what they play, see what decks are good against the decks that they play. You can even kind of play some mind games like that. I think my play is unique in the sense that um, I'm very like technical. I don't play a lot on intuition as much. Like I really like to have my you know, thoughts and game plans planned out and, and go from there. Uh, my personal goals this year is kind of to get back into Hearthstone. Because I took such a long break, I feel like I'm finally refreshed and ready to go. So that's one thing I'm just looking forward to get like that motivation back. I'm Facundo Pruso, more known as Nargivan. My username is an Illidan reference. I used to play Warcraft 3 a lot. Illidan is my favorite character. Back in the days, I really liked watching RDU stream as well, after I saw him for the first time on some drink tournament. And then I got to beat him on some online tournament finals. That was my first tournament win, my first prize win. That was a very key moment for me in Hearthstone. I think I'm pretty good at recognizing what decks are good and how to improve them. I like the Su play style. Some people think it's like broke back deck, but then you have a lot of things to master, and there is a lot of little things in that deck that, of course, you can draw one, two, three, four, and kill an opponent, but that's not gonna happen every game, and you know, you need to know how to improve your odds. I don't know if other players already respect me or not. In my region, I think they do. I'm not sure about the other Grandmasters. This year, I, I really want to qualify for Global Finals. I, well, I didn't make it last year, so that's the main goal. I hear a lot of players say first season didn't, wasn't that important, but I think it really is. If you win the first season, you made it to Global Finals.
Tarstone Grandmasters for the European region. We're in season two, day number two, match number two. And that's admirable. I'm joined by Sottle, and Sottle, uh silver name is up to a 1-0 lead over Viper uh, with a very aggressive start with Edwin Van Cleef. And now we're moving on to our second game. And Viper sticking on a Shaman and Silvernim going over to the old Highlander Hunter. Yes, Viper really does seem to be a fan of this uh, Shaman deck. He has protected it both weeks, uh, sorry, both days of the first week so far. That's what that little Divine Shield icon means. Uh, Silvername having already won with his protected deck, the Rogue, he's now moving over to that Highlander Hunter, which does have potential curves that can get on board a bit quicker than the Shaman and actually race effectively, especially if the Shaman doesn't find that Thunderhead to be able to swing the game back in the mid in the mid game. But nothing quite as explosive as that 6-6 Van Cleef uh, coming out that will really force Viper to be as reactive as possible. And Viper has a pretty glorious looking opener here for being able to fight for board early. Much better looking than his previous one. You know, something that I wanted to contrast on, I just didn't have the moment to, was uh, in yesterday's matches, Viper actually kept Doomhammer in an opening hand. Uh, but that was against a control warrior deck, or a slower warrior deck, rather. And just being able to have access to Doomhammer in that mat kind of matchup is one of the most important things. When you're playing against more aggressive decks, that's where the rest of the cards end up mattering. Stuff like Underbelly Angler, stuff like Lick'em. You want those cards early on. You do want them in the slow matches too, but they're needed early on to be able to battle against some of the pressure that the, uh, the faster decks can provide against you in order to fight back. You have to secure damage and you have to secure board. Snip Snap picked off the tracking for Silvername. Looked like the best option for his curve. He now has a uh, secret into Snip Snap. Only real problem he's going to run into with that combination is that Snip Snap is not a minion that really encourages Viper to trade into it. And that's what Silvername would like for his opponent to be doing. And he's going to have the Snake Trap to play. I think Viper here gives a nod to uh, Sun Reaver Spy and Zephyrus the Great coming down as just tempo plays. Uh, when he doesn't play the Sludge Slurper here, wants the option to play Lickum and be able to take that minion off board. He also knows that he's never against Explosive Trap. Uh, on Silvername's side. So being able to blast onto the board, a very realistic prospect here for Viper. His one counterplay to worry about on wide board states is Unleash the Hounds. Single copy. Witchy. I hate that one. I guess is kind of reasonable here. Some Reaver Spy of his own, sure. Bootleg Titanic Lackey. <laughs> You should have never introduced that phrase to me. Not <laughs> ahead now. Viper pretty much has it all coming together. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why you see Viper here going towards these more aggressive strategies. He has a, an aggro mech, hunt, uh, mech hunter, an aggro rogue, and an aggro shaman in his lineup is because when you introduce an element of inconsistency, in your deck, like being a Highlander deck and only playing one copy of each of the good cards, you can just sometimes get run over by an aggro curve. They can just beat you up and you don't have the answers to, to defeat them. Yeah, I mean, sometimes just the aggro decks are just good too. Like I think this aggro shaman is just a good deck right now. Agreed. Like it was missing a tool like Vicenna. Yep. It really was. And now that you have just that one singular tool, you look down at your deck and you go, wow, these one ones actually threaten my opponent now. Wow, I have bloodlust every turn. Attached to a 2 6 body. Yeah. Never interested in trading here as Viper. He yep. says, Your counterplay is slow. I'm going to push face with this Lickum. That secures nine points of damage over three turns. And that's the dynamic I alluded to on turn two, where he played that snake trap. He tracked into the snip snap, and I said, The only problem with that snip snap is that it is a very unattractive minion for Viper to trade into. And because of that, that snake trap is not going to get a great deal of work done. Thunderhead coin, make a wide board. Of course, you're thinking about pressure plate on the other side and how that interacts. Yep. The initial concern for Viper, I think, was snake trap. The secondary concern now is going to be pressure plate. And then the third concern will be rat trap. Hmm. What to do? And if you go with Thunderhead coin into an overload card, you are potentially bad against two of those options. Pressure plate, you can lose your Thunderhead before you even start spreading the board wide with the 1-1s to try and mitigate it. Rat Trap, of course, when you're all said and done with your Thunderbolt, with your Thunderhead and your Overloads, a 6-6 six, six Rat is going to pop out at the very end. So it's a pretty daunting prospect. Coins first, this plays around the Pressure Plate, doesn't have the Thunderhead on board. 
Gets the news that it is not the pressure plate. Now the Thunderhead comes down. Snake now Trap is next on the mind. And then Rat Trap. Yep. Think against Rat Trap, you're willing to just risk it. You have a wide enough board state that I think you threaten your opponent well in this situation. If it was Rat Trap, you would have the free damage from Lickum plus the two one ones and the uh, Witchy Lackey to take care of the 6-6 six, six if you wanted to. But again, that's the luxury of the aggro player. He gets to decide whether he would want to take that trade in that scenario. As it is, Viper gets to live his best life because it's Snake Trap, and that's the one that he just absolutely does not care about right now. Silvername offered with some counterplay option, though. We calling this counterplay? It's like all he has in his deck that actually does anything. I guess, yeah. You're gonna draw an eagle horn bow? Yeah. You're gonna draw kill command here? Yeah. I wonder. Just isolate the board damage. Just taking care of the Thunderhead, though. There's so many more problems that he has to face Yeah, I, I think I would have liked to see the board isolation in the pressure plate. I guess the problem there is that overload cards make two more 1-1s, one and pressure plate says after your opponent casts a spell. Okay. Viper now going to go back through the secrets and say, which one's bad for me? Looks like a freezing trap. Okay, it's not that. So now snipe and Rat Trap. Those are going to be on the mind. As well as Pressure Plate, of course. Yeah, Pressure Plate, uh, not as relevant as it was on the previous turn because the Thunderhead isn't part of the equation anymore. It's no huge deal to lose any of these individual minions. Of course, the 2-3 is the one that he wants to keep. Ooh, you love to see the 1-1 one, one in Viper Spot, too. Every single point of damage. Right. Yeah, nothing in his hand that will uh, benefit from spell damage in terms of burn that can be thrown at the base. Spell damage totem not particularly exciting right now. All right, silver name. Speaking of not very exciting, deadly shot. Yeah. Not not very exciting about the against this deck. He's got to get. He's got to figure out a way to get this going. That's not direct damage. Viper's one off. Realistically now, with the Life Drinker played for Silver Name, Viper has to not draw a single point of direct damage for the rest of the game, Basically. or for, for, for Silver Name to get out of this, or Asterisk Zephyrus. Well, has to not draw Zephyrus, you say. There's the boy. How do you manipulate what it gives you? It's going to be very heavily weighted towards a Hungry Crab right now because there is a Murloc on board and you don't want that. Healing touch. You want, you want to heal. Oh, no. Nope. So Zephyrus um, heavily prioritizes the board yes. in a lot of these situations. And so the first thing it sees is opponent's got four things. Let's try to blow those up. Yep. The second thing it sees is that your is that you have a beast on board? Take advantage of that. Yep. The third thing it will see is your life total. It finds options that it believes are more helpful than the life total scenario. And if you want to try and override that, you've really got to leave it at specific uh, mana breakpoints where it will look in a particular pool of cards. So if you really want to force it towards giving you a healing spell that costs three, for example, play it when you have three remaining, and then it's not going to give you Shadow Flame, for itself, for example. But I mean, offer it, but healing touch will be more prioritized right. because it reads three mana left. Yes. But I mean, in that position, that Shadow Flame was really good, honestly. Yeah. Like, it was a very, very good card. I mean, Zephyrus, in the words of the greats, you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you might find you get what you need. Yeah, thanks, Rolling Stones. I'm, I'm sure you, you barely ever get what you want. Dude, every time the Rolling Stones play Zephyrus, they just they just rip lethal every single time. I'm telling you, the world famous rock star with millions and millions of dollars and yeah. just everything at his beck and call. Well, you can't always get what you want. You're like, oh, shut up, Mick Jagger. 
Viper opting for the presence of damage on board. Is that Dino Tamer off the top? Dino it tamer. is, but Viper needs to secure a single point of damage. That's it. Yep. If Silvername wants to live, it's not Dino Tamer. Although, how does you know Viper's hand read into this? Viper's been clawing for damage in every single spot. I think it's you could safely assume there's at least five damage in hand in the form of Lava Burst. Yep. So if that's the case, oh, five and one. Oh boy, he's dead. Well, hang on, it hasn't hit play yet. I mean, the play to stay alive is like what Yo, trade, deadly out. shot, freezing trap. God. That's that's not a real Hearthstone play. Ah, uh, that's not true. You get to put in you get to put in all the secrets. Viper finds the damage. Doomhammer would have uh, taken away all counterplay options from Silvername in this spot. Bye-bye, yeah. 1-1. One, one. Didn't need you anymore anyway. You did your work. Good job. Good job, Witchy Lucky. 1-1 one, one score now. Viper strutting his stuff with the aggro shaman. This is the type of matchup it's meant to take advantage of. Matchups that are more oriented on the mid game and do not defend themselves superbly well in the early game. That's where that aggro shaman deck is absolutely going to shine. Yeah, uh, decks that don't have consistent early options that can answer a Murloc, for example, so it can snowball out of control and get lots of damage. Decks that don't consistently have ways to put up big taunt walls and big healing bursts to get out of way of just you chucking damage at their face, which is what Viper ended up doing. Um, Highlander decks kind of fit that description down to a T. They are just naturally inconsistent because of the way that they're put together. That means if you have a very consistent linear game plan of damage plus damage equals damage, then Highlanders can uh, struggle to deal with it. And so now for remaining for Silvername to choose from, he's got the Highlander Hunter and he's got Reno Mage uh, able to be played. His combo priest was banned away in this one. For Viper, he's got the Mech Hunter deck left, which features an Octosari uh, at the lone, co lone cost card above five mana and his own Reno Mage in this one. And considering how strong Highlander Hunter is versus uh, Reno Mage, or rather is the perception of that at least, I feel like the Mech Hunter is positioned to take advantage of the Highlander Hunter and the Reno Mage from Silvername based on those things that we just said. That yeah, it's an exactly. aggressive deck that takes advantage of lack of consistency in the early game. And that's the beauty of Viper's lineup for this week, is just recycle everything we just said. There's a couple of Highlander decks left available for Silvername to pick from and uh, Viper has another Hunter lined up that could potentially go into it. And I'm getting word that's uh, likely what he's going with in this one. So let's take a look at his Hunter deck and see exactly what's in store. You know, this was a deck that was in Silvername's back pocket for uh, you know a lot of last season. He yeah. continued to play Mech Hunter, and it to continue to not work. And for Viper here, I asked him about this yesterday, and uh, you know he gave us a pretty full breakdown of what's in here. It is pretty much purely a metagame choice. Harvest Golem's in here because it's a mech that has Death Rattle and it likely sticks to the board for Magnetic. Good enough explanation for me. Yep, sounds about right. Um, and then that Octosari is the big question mark. We saw the potential. I was kind of making fun of it saying, yeah, sure, if you draw a perfect curve and then you have Octosari as the last card as your hand just expends of resources, it's going to be amazing. It's pretty much what Viper had in his first game, but it was his opening curve was so good that he did not even get to the point of the game where Octosari would have been relevant. So we're off, and Silvername's running back the Hunter deck. I think it's his uh, best chance because Mage, in my opinion, really struggles to Mech Hunter, and especially a, a clean one built like how Viper has here. You know, it's super lean. And he talked about the Octasari a bit yesterday, where he's like, you need a big drop at the end of the game, and your options are like Boom Master Flark. Uh, you have some other thing that he said that I don't remember, and. Octasari, why not? He said the card draw off, it's very relevant too. You put together combos like Venomizer and Missile Launcher. Uh, it's going to find your lone copy of Leroy. It's going to give you ways to reload the board with uh, and fight back with Spider Bomb and Fireworks Tech. I think it's a pretty smart choice, honestly. Well, no great impact on the game yesterday. We'll see if Octodad can come good this time around. Viper, once again, most importantly, has the dream curve. Galvanizer into Venomizer. And well, when you draw a Missile Launcher, I feel like a lot of your thoughts on Venomizer plays change a bit. I uh, it, Yes, in certain contexts, yes. And I think with the fact this curve is uh, going first without a one drop, he's going to have the Snip Snap option available to him as well on top of that. Um, so that changes things. Silverdame draws a secret. This is a completely different game. It is. It's a spell. I think it was Unleashed, though, it was. Viper dodged a big bullet right there. 
well, there's still Zephyrus Backstab available. As long as Zephyrus is a good boy and understands that killing mechs is really important, because this is another thing about Zephyrus. He can look at a 1-2 and say, oh, that's a 1-2. You don't care about that. He does. Backstab. Picked up. Vitally important. Good play from Silvername to recognize that was an option, recognize it was important. Good play from Zephyrus as well to recognize the situation. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just go out there as Zephyrus. You give it 110%. <laughs> and, uh, you hope for the best. And, you know, they had us in the first half, but... Honestly, I feel like my Zephyrus just wanted it more. <laughs> yeah, and so I think when Viper falls behind here, the, the kicker to his hand now is the Missile Launcher Venomizer. On turn yeah, six, sure. you have a way to sweep out the board. For sure. The problem with that, of course, is the opposing play from Hunter's side. I think Hunter is one of the classes where this doesn't function the best against because you're thinking about Freezing Trap. Thinking about Deadly Shot. Both of those offer uh, pretty strong counterplay options to a Venomizer Missile Launcher. So for Viper here, I think his hopes is that he can force out a play like that mm -hmm. and then be able to secure that big play. As it stands, he's still in a fight for board. Yeah, fight for board that he is currently losing. And the good I plays won. from Silvername show no sign of letting up. He has Hellmaster Shore and Ziliax available over the coming turns. Going to be able to make a real mess of uh, Viper's ability to develop anything super relevant. Yep, and Ursatron uh, will fetch the copy of Snip Snap now, as the Ziliax is already in hand. The two mechs it has options for are those two. And the Houndmaster Shaw and Snip Snap operates like a bootleg Dr. Boot Mad Genius. My <laughs> I hope towards the end of the season we can have a highlight clip where it's just all the times I've said that and it's all melded together in just one giant amalgamation of me saying bootleg with like a ding counter on it. Mm -hmm. And also just my silent reaction that the viewer doesn't get to see to each <laughs> time you're doing it. Yeah. For each time you go, <sighs> I wonder. Well, now, Venomizer. Looks a lot more appealing. It does. And double load this up, or is he gonna, yeah, okay, just sacrifice. Separate yeah, destroy. Some venomized minions. A little bit better against uh, small removal plus deadly shot. It takes away deadly shot 50 50, like really just ending the game for you. And also, it's just a bunch of damage to the face. Stack him? No, you don't stack him. There's Poisonous. Okay. There's poisonous boy. I'm so bad at remembering poisonous. <laughs> Looking pretty solid for Silvername. Not only has he had a lot of his um, early game board focus cards to be able to stave off what Viper's been trying to do, he also has access to basically all of the healing uh, in his deck as well with uh, with Life Drinker and Ziliax. I think Viper's about to find himself uh, a potential missile launcher play here. I think the Missile Launcher might get loaded onto the non-poisonous one as well. And the idea would be you smack a minion, smack a minion, and then clear off all the 1-1s. One -ones. However, that offers the same risk, right? I mean, the mechanic of this deck is if you have a mech in play, magnetic equals charge. Yeah. So how much damage can you, can you just push instead? There are so many different angles to think from in this spot. Like, this is aggro in a nutshell. All of your decisions are very small decisions, but they carry major implications. Perhaps you don't attach it. You separate. Ah! Yeah, attaching kind of seemed strange to me initially because you have to, you know, ship that damage into a minion to trade anyway to get the missile launcher value. And then because you have the other poisonous guy on board, by not magneticing to the poisonous guy, you're going to then kill the magnetic guy. Sorry, kill the poison guy with your missile launcher anyway. Um, so this plan C does seem like the best way around of doing it. You've won the fight for board. Yep. Temporarily, at least. Springpore and Ziliax does have a little something to say about that. 
I'm looking at Bomb Toss War Gear as the response. Yeah. It's a very, very good answer. These are all things that Viper's thought about. That means a connection for 10 is about to take place. Perhaps you don't connect, though. You're like, maybe you separate again? I would find that tough to believe. And one of the reasons why is you just drew another magnetic minion, so that 0-2 represents activated charge damage. I'm not sure if Viper will have any real read on Deadly Shot just yet. There hasn't been this kind of situation where it's just one big minion sat around on the board up until this point. Passing up five damage here is a really big call to make. Ah. I wonder what this does. I guess that pushes him three more as well, and we gets to fit in the hero power alongside that, so he gets the same five out of it Smart. while playing around Deadly Shot at the same time. How many times do you need to hit hero power if you attack that one time? He's calculated that, it's this many. And so now he gets two more from the death rattle on this bomb. Silver name invests into clearing out the board state. You fit in a hero power there, which means you get to connect on a magnetic again and weave in another hero power. Yep. Old school face hunter 101. Count backwards. How many turns is it going to take you to win the game if you start hero powering every single turn? That's just fundamentals. Yep. This is just a good fundamentals game from Viper. Yeah, it's over name. He's desperate now. Ooh, mine's deadly shot, but you're at four. And that's a big 28 life on the other side. Yeah. Multiple minions for Viper available as well. Missile launcher, of course, is a source of damage in itself. It's going to activate the snipe here. So you don't get the fireworks tech. Ah, is that something he's thinking about? Maybe I fireworks tech first. Yeah. I agree it's not worth the risk. Feels awkward, like, perfect world. I want to hero power and get the missile launcher into play here, just so it's rec you know, representing the maximum damage possible. That just wasn't a possibility when facing down the secrets. And now Silvername does buy himself just a couple of turns with that life drinker. Yep. That's important, too, because now he's got two turns to draw Soljin yep. instead of just one. There's a tracking in the deck for Silvername as well. So that being his next draw Ooh, could also help him find Soljin. But outside of that... Oh! Whoa, no way. Deadly shot in the pool. Animal companion in the pool. Unleash the hounds. Unleash the hounds in the pool. But Secrets. most importantly, it's just that number in the bottom right. Five armor. Yeah. See Viper's reaction to it. He had lethal set up next turn with the missile launcher. The backstab in the pool. As well. He's going to uh, neuter his Unleash the Hounds, unfortunately, for Silvernake. Gets the card drawer as well. Hunter's pack is found. Just anything that can provide damage. Four turns of hero power needed now for Viper without dying. And that's a much taller order now because Silvernake's got the board secure and he's got a kill command in hand. Viper knows the situation now with the secrets. Rat Trap would have been shown but not played because there was one already in play. He knows that the other secret is the one that he's already seen the snipe. Eagle Horn Bow picked up and that's a two turn clock now. Was Hunter's pack correct there? Does he need to kill Sure. Him? Does he need to kill command while he had the beast instead? Because Ah, that's a good question. Because you have no guarantee that the, the Hunter's pack is gonna give you a cheap enough beast to then kill command afterwards, right? Does it change the clock if he only uh, KCs for three instead? 
Yes, it does. Harvest Golem. Activates Snipe. Venomizer. Attached to the 2-1. Missile Launcher. Attached to those. 11 mana. That's 11 mana. That doesn't work. Nope. I think Viper's dead. Wow. I just can't get the combo to go off because of the snipe. It's so cruel. From the backstab to the life drinker yep. to the Zuljin being found in the perfect turn. Every single point of health for Silver Name mattered this game. Yep. Is there an extra point of damage anywhere that Viper could have found on his side? It, it would have been found sheerly through aggression and then success rate on that aggression. That's it, it I think. Me. I liked the way he played this game. He just got got, I think. Silvername played this pretty darn well and just maximized his odds. Found the way. And with that, Silvername, sigh of relief as the kill command comes in, defeats Viper and starts out two and zero, and he can't even believe he's it! He's gone. He's gone. The pop-off is commencing. You can't see it. But he's somewhere jumping through a wall in his house. That was unreal. I mean, that every point of health mattered in that game. Yeah, literally, like, all of the early game cards that he had to be able to fight as effectively as he did and stave off aggression until about turn five, turn six from Viper, that's which, when he really took over, which you absolutely expect the mech deck to do at some point because they're just much more consistent in drawing those aggressive curves. Um, so not only did Silvername have this really powerful early curve, which was able to stave off for a little while, but he then had the Ziliax, which gained him extra turns, the Life Drinker, which gained him extra turns, the Unleash the Hounds, which is one like mass wide removal card in the deck available. And then because of all that extra health he gained from Unleash removal, from Life Drinker, from Ziliax, he had one more turn to live to get him to turn 10, where just the... The Zuljin just obliges, just off the top, into the empty hand, boom. Big axe. Big axe. And so just like yesterday, we cannot interview Silvername because neither Sadol nor myself speak Russian. So that's unfortunate, but Silvername, this is a major differential from what he had in Season 1, where his Season 1 was looking rough. He is off to a 2-0 and zero start. And that's the top of the division, effectively, right now. Pretty much, yeah. He was 5-9 and nine in total last season. Now he gets off to a 2-0 and zero, uh, start. Much, much greater fortunes this time around. Viper, on the other hand, of course, he was 8-6 and six last season. He had a very, very near miss. He was right in uh, playoff contention, sitting on that tiebreaker line. We were doing all the tiebreaker maths back and forth, trying to work out how Viper was going to qualify, but he did end up missing out by a very fine margin. He starts off 1-1 one one in Season 2. Still a solid performance overall, though. I think, uh, you know, game number three is going to be a matter of uh, semantics and debates, where if you're going to look at that game and see if Viper could have done anything differently, it was just aggressive initiative. Was it worth more to just simply magnetic and attack and hope that that succeeds or sacrifice the long-term damage of the hero power where your opponent has an ability to top deck. And I think that's just a call where he ended up in the right spot yeah. and just got unlucky. That's cards sometimes. Yeah, it's worth noting that the way Viper plays wins the game every time if his opponent doesn't have every point of healing in his deck plus Zildjian. Like yeah. That's an important way to frame the context of how they play that game. And so that brings us